Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Owen Redwood, and this is the Web Application Hacking and Security 103 lecture of the Offensive Computer Security 2.0 Open Courseware, provided by HackAllTheThings.com. Today's lecture video is touched up and repurposed from the last time this lecture was taught. So we're going to cover the basics, the history of SSL and TLS, many of the flaws, um, and related to that, the important attacks in history, and some of the lessons learned or rather ignored. Um, there have been a number of uh, bugs in implementations for SSL and TLS, namely the GNUutils bug, the iOS go to fail bug, and those are the two big ones from just these this year in the past three months. Um, there have been many others throughout history, but we're going to cover some tools like SSL strip, SSL sniff, and then attacks against the crypto itself, such as beast and crime. We'll just, just touch on them. So SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. It was developed by the guys at Netscape way back in the day. Um, you could see it conceptually as in the OSI model as being a session uh, layer protocol, but effectively it's an application layer protocol as well. It's designed to provide secure communication over the internet. Um, it uses asymmetric key cryptography, otherwise public key cryptography, uh, to exchange a symmetric key, and then that symmetric key is used for the rest of the communication. Um, and it basically guarantees confidentiality and integrity as well as authenticity at least one way. So <clears throat> SSL and TLS are often synonymously used. In fact, TLS, which is defined in RFC 5246, is in spirit supposed to be the successor to SSL but it's actually derived from an earlier version of SSL itself. So just like SSL, it uses public key cryptography to exchange a symmetric key, well, to ex establish and then exchange a symmetric key, um, and then uses symmetric key for the rest of the communication, as far as confidentiality and integrity, as well as authenticity for at least one way. So. When SSL and TLS were designed, it was meant to secure the internet. The internet was not designed with security in mind, and they were trying to, the guys at Netscape, try to secure things like web browsing, email, instant messaging, VoIP, and SSL and TLS has many more uses extending to uh, update chains, um, contacting the web server or the update server and downloading the correct patches, stuff like that. It, usually, it touches almost every aspect of most software, um, every aspect of most communication to a central server or something like that in software, I should rather say. So in the early 90s, the engineers at Netscape developed SSL to make secure HTTP requests. Back in those days, the, how do we say, cybersecurity crypto field was kind of new. Crypto had been along for a long time, and the Enigma uh, story and all the stories before that point to uh, its history. However, there was a very, very scarce body of knowledge on how to actually design secure protocols well. And what we teach now in cryptography classes is this cat and mouse game that we first had this protocol. And, oh, here comes this attack. It's a replay attack. It does this and allows me to purchase now a thousand birthday cakes instead of just one. And a slew of other types of attacks. And it basically shows, here was the original protocol. Here's the attack against it. Here was the fix. And then this became the standard. And rinse, repeat. So... Later on in this lecture, I refer to the work of Moxie Monspike, and I think the, yes, the required reading, one of the reading items for today's lecture, is actually a DEF CON Black Hat video by Moxie Marlinspike. 
and uh, he uh, cold called one of the engineers on the team from Netscape to make SSL. And SSL is quote unquote a collection of 4 a.m. decisions, and it is really amazing that it has lasted this long. <clears throat> it now faces serious problems with authenticity. There's there's diminishing trust. Um, and the certificate authority structure around the world and how governments can influence it. Hackers are getting much, much more smarter and nowadays we know much more about how to secure things. Um, so in the end, what is needed to secure the internet and the communication from clients to servers is something to provide secrecy, integrity, and authenticity. So let's go over what SSL and TLS at a high level do. At first, the client, when he's making the initial request, sends his request and informs the server that this is my SSL version, or these are the versions that I support. Here are my cipher options. Here's other session data to identify me, and etc. And the server responds accordingly with the SSL versions, TLS versions that the server supports, and the cipher options that it supports as well. It also notably provides its own certificate. Now the client, instead of just trusting the certificate, should go about validating the certificate, trust but verify in a sense. <clears throat> and if he sees a certificate in the list of stored or saved or approved certificates in the browser that either come default with the browser or that the user his or herself approved and said to permanently store this exception, then all is good. Otherwise, if that is not something that can be locally valid, verified, the, the client has to contact whoever signed the certificate, and which is basically a trusted third party, provided that the trusted third party is something that the client trusts, and then basically recursively validate that chain of trust. If the most immediate person or CA who signed the, the cert is not trusted by the client, the client will keep going back up in the chain until it finds a trusted root in the certificate trust chain. So, despite all that, <laughs> nine times out of a ten, if authentication here fails, a user will be presented a warning saying that there was a problem with the certificate, would you like to proceed anyways? And they will click yes anyways. That being said, after this point, and if the authentication succeeds of the server certificate from the client, they will basically, using the public-private key of the server, and whatever cert provided by the browser, usually some default thing by the client, um, will use asymmetric key cryptography to basically perform Diffie-Hellman or something like that to establish a symmetric key. And the first, the, the thing that's important here is that they use asymmetric key encryption or public key crypto to establish this symmetric key, which comes next. So at that point, the key is, the symmetric key for the rest of the communication has been established. The client sends a message saying, begin encrypted session, and this is all going to be encapsulated in the public key crypto. So all of this is not visible to a attacker. And at this point, they abandon the public key crypto and proceed solely with the symmetric key crypto for the rest of the session. So the, the reason for doing all of this is that it provides perfect forward secrecy and that's an, a phenomenon that's taught in most crypto classes. In essence, that you cannot view this communication unless you break this. So in order to break this communication, you first have to break the asymmetric key crypto that is used to set up the, uh, the symmetric key. Then you have to break the symmetric key, uh, establish, uh, symmetric key algorithm that establishes the symmetric key to even break this encryption. So, 
if you break the, the private public key of the server, you're able to spy on all the communication. However, you still have to break the session key or the shared symmetric key for each session. Hence, the term perfect forward secrecy means that even if you do break this layer of crypto, you don't break all the ones at this point and also going forward. Um, so, when <clears throat> When a client uses certificate info to authenticate a server, it'll go to a certificate authority, and the authority will look at the cert that the client says, hey, this is what I got, and it will decide either that this key belongs to the server or it doesn't, um, provided that the browser trusts the CA to even go to the CA somewhere in that chain. And it's important to note that this is the, the 10,000 foot view of SSL and TLS and the implementation details can definitely vary. Um, and they definitely vary over versions of applications, versions of SSL and crypto libraries. And, <clears throat> and uh, I guess another thing to note is that uh, this validation is not done on the server side. The server doesn't care about the certificate of, of the client. Um, if the server had to cache or store the certificate for every single client, just imagine the the cost that would be for Google, the cost that would be for uh, Amazon and every other uh, website. In essence, all that's needed to do business is a trusted vendor, and then pass that in order to use your your PayPal or use your credit card or something, you have to provide some more authentication details to let the server charge effectively uh, you for a transaction. So there's a bit more at the business logic that allows you to abstract out the, the need for having that huge cost of keeping track of every client and their potential certificates if they, you know, if you went that route. So the Netscape guys and gals decided that this was not necessary and this would totally slow down the internet. So, also at that point, a decision was made, and this decision has not been usurped or changed up till up through now, that trust is just too hard for normal users to think about. So the browsers collectively decide the trust for you and it should be noted that the certs that ship with your browser when you download it, usually for free, uh, are the same regardless of where you're from, where, where in the world you are, what country you're in. You're going to have default certificates that allow you to have the same user experience as anyone else around the world. On average, root certificate authorities wise, Browsers usually ship trusting 40 root CAs and trust about 25 intermediate CAs. And this is coming from Google Chrome. And then also, as I said, users can and usually will add their certificates for websites that they really want to go to. Now, this is for securing the web traffic on the Internet, for securing your communication with your bank, for securing your communication to do e-commerce. I don't know 40 people that I trust with information, you know, to hand courier my identifying information, my personal information, and my credentials to do a transaction all the way to the bank and back. I don't physically know 40 people that I trust with that information to do physically. But the browser just decided that, you know, this is just too hard for normal users to think about. So this was the way it was decided to be done. So certificates, as I said, uh, are used to do SSL and TLS, and they're composed of a public key and a private key. And the public key certificate, usually just referred to as de facto, the certificate is a digitally signed statement by, signed by a trusted third party that binds the value of a public key to an identity of a person, device, service, blah, 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 that holds the corresponding private key. And usually it's facilitated by using the X509 standard for certificates. 
And this was designed in 1980 or the 1980s. It was messy back then, it was overly flexible and very gentle. It allowed a lot of room for misbehavior. So when I say the term signing or digital signatures is the act of using your private key, which you never share um, uh, for a certificate to sign a message. Um, in order to check the signature, you decrypt the message with the public key. Messages sent this way provide uh, authenticity. You can only decrypt it if you have the public key that corresponds to the private key, which is thus tied to the owner of that certificate and also non-repudiation. If you send out a digitally signed message and then later say, oh crap, I was drunk, I didn't mean to send that, there's no way to undo this with digital signatures. So, to establish chains of trust, um, private keys can be used to sign other users' public keys. This is how certificates are formed. And this is how stat trust relationships are established. So, for instance, VeriSign can sign the relationship for uh, fsucybersecurityclub.com. And whenever a user visits the club's website, they will, provide, they, they will be provided a, a certificate containing a public key that has been signed by VeriSign. And the user's browser can then go to VeriSign and verify that, hey, this is all legit. So this all relies on you protecting your private key. Um, it is possible, and actually not too uncommon, for CAs to use their private key to sign the private keys of other CAs, but that gets messy and weird and allows basically signed chain of trust allowing um, a CA to uh, sign away on behalf of uh, another CA. Um, so the aforementioned public key infrastructure is really just a set of servers, people, policies, um, hardware, and poli procedures, policy, the same thing, to manage the creation, management, distribution, the revocation and blacklisting, the use, and finally the storage of certificates. Um, for what we'll say later in this uh, lecture about the bad things about uh, SSL and how it's all played out, certificate blacklists do exist. They do work. Um, browsers do check them, usually automatically. Um, but we've seen bugs in the implementations of uh, for instance, GNU Utils, where it doesn't really check uh, them all the time, and if you craft it just right, it just accepts it anyways. So that being said, um, the basic architecture of public key infrastructure revolves around a certificate authority, um, which works with two other authorities, the validation authority and the registration authority, to make this whole system work. So the certificate authority is responsible for binding the public key uh, with the respective user who's applying for an identity. So users must be unique. Um, and the CA will use its own private key to sign each user's public key. And obviously, uh, for every user, they have to have their own unique uh, public-private key. Otherwise, I could, if I share public private keys with another person and they are, say, company A and I'm company B, if I submitted the same private public key, I could sign off as company A all day and impersonate them all day, web traffic-wise. So the next thing is validation authorities, which are supposed to be a third party to provide uh, user information and to vouch for user information. They're involved with the whole registration process and then the final issuance decision. Um, and then finally, speaking of the registration process, there's the registration authority, which is perhaps another third party, 
perhaps not, maybe it's just someone working at the CA, that exists to ensure the public key is bound to the individual which is signed. It's supposed to be a watchdog, same with the validation authority, um, and this is designed to ensure non-repudiation. And as I said, there can be root certificate authorities and the intermediate certificate authorities. Effectively, what's happened there is that the root certificate authority has signed off on the intermediate certificate authority, perhaps to delegate some of the workload because the internet is so huge. The ability to sign the key of other CAs. And if this person isn't trusted, but this person is, if this person signs the certificate for a website, a user, when they get that certificate, will go here, but then go here and say, oh, okay, this chain of trust is valid, I respect it. At least the browser will automatically do that for you. So it begs the question if this loop should ever exist and the weirdness that this can induce, especially with the, the responsibilities that might be required, and separation of duties, maybe there's a conflict of interest here, but We've seen it in the past. It should not happen. Um, if you have enough money and find a sleazy enough certificate authority, it's definitely an option. So if you're a website and also a user, this is a nice diagram for illustrating for illustrating how it all plays out. The first step is you would ask the certificate authority if you want to run a website and you want to get SSL uh, HTTPS for your users. You ask the certificate authority to issue a certificate in your name, pay the fee. Perhaps they use that money to go do a background check. Perhaps they use that money to throw a really sweet party. You can't really tell the difference from the outside. Um, and the second thing is that they'll do their magic. They'll do their thing. They'll do some of this and then issue you, you a certificate. Um, and then when a user browses your website, you'll present a certificate containing your identity and your public key. And the user hasn't seen you before, so what they do is they go to the certificate authority and say, hey, is this a valid certificate for this person? You are the person, you are the CA who has signed off on it. The CA will check the certificate against their list of issued certificates and make sure that it hasn't been altered, hasn't been tampered with, hasn't expired, and, and that they've also paid their their monthly fee, and then reply with decision. And for, for instance, let's just say it's valid. So the certificate authority will tell the user's browser that this is a valid cert. And at that point, the user now trusts this website and proceeds with HTTPS navigation. Assuming that it's all done right, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, I believe. So, how do you get a cert? Um, effectively, you are buying trust. That's a very important thing to remember at the end of the day. We see prices here, this is just from browsing the internet from last year, of certs ranging from, I can get one for $49 a month, all the way to $500, $600 a month. And maybe they provide different things, but at the end of the day, they provide that HTTPS on my user's uh, browser. And they don't care about the quality of certs. I mean, these people, these people are all trustworthy, right? So market forces considered, this drives websites to buy cheaper and cheaper certs because the users don't care and spending more on your certs doesn't improve any quality of use for your users. It doesn't bring in any more money. And if the cert does something wrong, it's not your responsibility anyways, right? So this drives people to buy the cheapest certs. And sometimes they just go for free certificate authorities and I, I, I beg you to think about how you do all the registration issuance and validation if you're not making any money and doing it all for charity or rather how you're saying you're doing all that stuff and managing to throw really sweet parties um, with your customers wisely begotten money um, so who can become a certificate authorities the next question 
Well, you can, I can, anyone can become a certificate authority. Anyone can start issuing certs. You will visit websites that self-sign their certificate all day long, and that doesn't stop users from just clicking yes because it's so common. So why spend all that money if users are just going to click yes anyways? So the problem is if you want to become a CA, you have to get someone to trust you. Um, in order to be automatically recognized by a browser. As I said, nine times out of ten, people are just going to click on it anyways and proceed anyways. But we're, we want to get that last one out of ten. We want to figure out what it takes to get that last one out of ten, to get 100% of people on the Internet. And in order to do that, if you're going the legitimate CA route, you're going to have to get people to trust you. And back in the day, this was easy. But we're approaching... A billion, this doesn't go up through 2013, let alone 2014, billion uh, websites on the Internet. And I can't imagine any single authority securing all of them. Back in the day, in the early days, there was one certificate authority, one to rule them all. It was VeriSign. And eventually at one point, the Internet grew too large for one certificate authority in the centralized manner to trust. And so more certificate authorities popped up, and then intermediate certificate authorities popped up, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And now there are many certificate authorities that are providing this trusted platform of certs and certificate public key infrastructure uh, to secure the web traffic. However, this is not a scalable solution, as you can imagine. You can't. It's, the security of this architecture is only as good as its weakest link. And as we keep adding more and more leaks, link, links, the probability of the weakest link, you know, <laughs> degrading in their security is pretty much 100% um, with enough. Uh, people and it's the mix. So as I said, at one point there was just VeriSign and then there has now been an explosion of certificate authorities that you could potentially trust. And in practice, this may be my jaded personal view, but I stick by it, that certificate authorities are a single point of failure on the internet. They are a top target for hackers on the internet. And they look really bad if they get hacked. How are they going to keep getting your $500 a month if uh, they tell you they've been hacked every time they've been hacked? <laughs> That's my jaded way of putting it. Um, it is all too common for security authorities to brush their compromises under the rug and wait till next month to issue a new cert so it all looks gravy. So, in practice, uh, other researchers have found that validation authorities don't exist. Uh, this is not used in practice. As long as your paycheck uh, clears, you get a cert usually, as long as you haven't been involved in some blacklisted activities. And it's really just issuance, issuance, registration, registration. And the registration authority is usually going to be just some underpaid or unpaid intern at the certificate authority that probably just watches for their customers uh, popping up on Reddit or popping up on other sites saying that they've been hacked or users saying that this looks like it's been hacked. Bottom line, I'm try the way I see it, is that doing everything right costs money. And the market forces drive websites and your competition, if you're running a website, to use the cheapest certs that are out there. And the pricing is all artificial anyways. What is trust? You're effectively buying trust when you're purchasing into this public key infrastructure scheme. And this is what's used to secure the web traffic for the whole Internet. There is no widely adopted alternative, period. And in practice, we're going to cover some of the history demonstrating that there are zero consequences 
when absolutely everything goes wrong in this model and hackers make tons of money, steal all the secrets, and your CEO, as a consequence, perhaps will get named the innovator of the year. So before we go into that spiel, um, let's cover some timeline that uh, in the 80s, that's when the X509 certificate was designed, the standard for it. Um, and ever since, there have been a long history of implementation vulnerabilities outside of just SSL and TLS. It's important to note that the X509 certificate has uses outside of SSL and TLS. In the 90s, SSL was conceived by the Netscape group, and it was largely a hand wave, to quote, or rather to paraphrase the required reading later on. <clears throat> so, in 2009, there were three major vulnerabilities to the effect of the entire world just due to C certificate authority mistakes. And one of them, I believe, was that they just put their public key, their private key, in their public HTML directory, which was completely accessible to the entire world. And there is a body of work and body of people investigating uh, CA shenanigans involving governments, involving shady deals, and involving other things. And we're going to peruse SSL Observatory in a little bit. Actually, we're going to do it now. So, this map provided by the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, is a map of about 700 certificate authorities that, by default, between Microsoft browsers and Mozilla browsers, i.e. Internet Explorer and Firefox, trust out of the box. It's a big giant mess. And let's zoom in to find some good ones. Um, there is CyberTrust Japan. And if I name a certificate authority, it's not necessarily targeting them as anything in particular, just reading them out. Obviously, there's Microsoft Root Certificate Authority. Um, there's GoDaddy. There's a whole network called the User Trust Network. Um, there's CNNIC, which is one of the largest in the world. I believe uh, signs for almost everything in China. Um, let's see. There's Equifax. There's Walt Disney. There is GoDaddy again. There's RSA. Um, we go over here, show you some good ones. DigiNoter, yeah, we're going to talk about them in a little bit. I don't think they exist anymore. Um, there's AOL, there's all these other ones. Oh, and then there's uh, there's one that's pretty much uh, looks like shellcode. And then there's VeriSign, the VeriSign Trust Network as well. And... There's another one that looks just like shellcode. You know, don't be alarmed that your browser just trusts these by default out of the box. You know, it's on the internet. It must be safe. <sighs> see. There are some other good ones in here. Um, there's government CA. Yeah, that's... Which government? <laughs> there's Ford. There's Global Sign. There are tons of others. And this giant web of, of certificate authorities, the root is DFN uh, Vera Ein. And you can see if you look that it signs predominantly for a ton of universities in Europe. And it's a very, very large network spanning many different languages. Um, Europe is pretty diverse, so I guess this may be necessary. But Despite this giant network of trust, it is really, from the outside looking in, a mess. And despite how it's been architected, you have to take it with a grain of salt because at the end of the day, your users are still likely to just click through despite what the certificate warning says. So think about that. I, Going back to the this giant map, by default, these CAs 
are trusted to secure your web traffic on the internet. Your browser automatically trusts this entire network. Even the big anomalous shellcode looking certs. Those are trusted by default. And this map is maintained by EFF.org and they are a very interesting and useful organization um, that champion internet freedom and the rights of hackers around the world. And, uh, fight back against stupid laws that put people in jail for more time um, than they deserve because the world and senators and legislators don't understand this mess. So, there are some noteworthy certificate authorities on that list. Some government-owned ones, like the Department of Homeland Security. Um, uh, some U.S. defense contractors on there. There's the China, China Internet Network Information Center, CNNIC. I think I pointed that out. There's Edis Lot, which I think is in is like the fifth. It's in the top five largest telecom corporations in the entire world. Um, and your browser trusts all these by default, out of the box. Now, there, that raises a scoping issue. What if I'm in, uh, here's a good example, what if I'm in Ukraine right now? Uh, my browser is likely going to trust some Russian-owned certificate authorities out of the box. And I may not like that. Now, on the flip side, you know, my, if I'm Russian, they may trust some Ukrainian-owned certificate authorities and also some U.S.-owned certificate authorities. And other countries aside, I guarantee you, you could find a large body of people here in the United States that would never trust by default, anything signed by the United States. And same goes for China. They would never trust anything from signed by uh, anything uh, Chinese government owned. So this complicates the issue of trust and also complicates the problem that we've just decided over time to just solve it for people and have a best fit solution that tries to be as appeasing to the largest group of people. There's a lot of adages that you could say, such as, if you try to please everyone, you're going to please no one, and that may certainly apply here, but this is a very complicated issue that can't be summed up by any one quip. So back to securing the internet and where we are today. There is work to invent a new internet, um, mostly spawning out of academia, and it's really struggling at the moment, and I don't know if it'll pick, ever pick off, pick up. Um, and it may not embrace the anonymity of the current iteration of the Internet. And it'll be interesting to see if there are two simultaneous Internets, and if they are ever bridged. They likely will. You can't ever stop that. But it would be interesting. Now, it's very, very important to note that this is the um, survey of websites that are publicly facing the internet. There is something called the dark net out there. Um, and it is actually huge. Usually you have to VPN into a node and you'll see thousands of websites, usually to facilitate black market activity, trading drugs, trading information, trading O-days, and trading this and that. And it's largely anonymous, probably bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies dominate the marketplaces there. Um, but uh, these are websites and internets in themselves that do not face the internet. And they are fun to explore, let me just put it that way. Though you are going to get attacked for sure on them. Um, so take precautions if you if your curiosity strikes and don't get into trouble. Because trouble will find you. So let's talk about some important certificate authority attacks. Um, and I use the, the word attacks in quotation marks on this slide because none of these are actually attacks. These, the following uh, items are the results of people who are just security researchers trying to f find out how, trying to verify the integrity of public key infrastructure and this whole thing we've got going on. So an important story is Mike Zussman obtained Microsoft's login.live.com certificate 
private key also by simply just asking for it. it. Didn't really even provide a reason. The CA was like, sure, here you go. And that was it. This is just to perform his security research. And that's a huge red flag when your CA is just handing over the certificate that you provided it, you know, and you pay the $500 a month for um, just willy-nilly like that. Eddie Nig uh, obtained Mozilla.com's certificate, and there was no validation authority existing that stopped him. Um, and he was simply just investigating unethical CA practices. And I believe he was at it for less than a week, and he basically hit the jackpot. Which seriously calls into question the whole validity, validity of whether or not this is working at the moment. Um, there's another issue, I forget the date, but VeriSign issued a code signing cert just by accident from Microsoft Corporation to a group of unknown hackers. And as we said earlier, talking about um, rootkits, I believe, that this certificate is a, was actually a code signing certificate. It could sign kernel mode driver updates. It could sign Windows updates. It could sign applications. It could sign things coming that would look like uh, trusted from Microsoft itself, Microsoft services itself. And these attackers could man the middle and provide malware all day long, and nothing, no flags would ever be raised. And this was just, you know, a whoops. And these were just the uh, actions of unsophisticated attackers. And whenever you talk about sophistication of attackers, it always scales up to APT. And that's when people get nervous talking about this word cyber and capabilities. And I just it, It's scary to realize how much damage a few people could do when they don't put in any effort to do it and the whole system just completely collapses. Imagine what the big dogs could do for corporate espionage to terrorism to state stuff, yeah, etc. Um, so this is a, another attack. It's not really against certificate authority. Uh, so this slide is out of place. I'm not trying to pick on RSA, but it's an event that affected the vast majority of the internet. That's the scale of attacks and impact that we're talking about. So that's the only reason I included it on this lecture. So. In 2010, RSA's Secure ID program was compromised, and their key fobs all had to be recalled. And basically, this attack impacted about 760 companies. It affected 20% of the Fortune 100 list, many more in the Fortune 500. And if you want to read more about it, you can read it here. Um, Komodo, however, is the first big CA attack that we're going to talk about. It was hacked in March 2011, and it made the headlines because they came and said that they suspect that Iran is hacking them. And you're going to have Fox News and CNN and MSNBC all say, oh my god, Iran is hacking us, trying to bring down the internet. Um, but uh, they actually did get some serious information on the attacker. The attacker was sloppy, and they tracked it back to an IP address in Iran and also tracked it back to G lat long uh, coordinates for GPS and the attacker was successful. The attacker uh, compromised Komodo and made off with signing certs for mail.google.com, google.com, login.yahoo, login.skype, adams.mozilla, login.live and I just want to make you wonder if the attacker hadn't been so sloppy if this would have ever been found out. Because the only reason I'm talking about this is the drama. Um, immediately after they detected the attack, um, however long that took them to detect, sometimes it's months, sometimes it's years. If they're lucky, sometimes it's a day. Maybe sometimes if they have good IR people, good uh, sysadmins, they can detect it in real time. So immediately after the attack of the attack, the CEO issued the following statement. This attack was extremely sophisticated and critically executed. It was very well orchestrated, a very clinical attack, and the attacker knew exactly what they needed to do and how fast they had to operate. And at the same time, in the same statement, the CEO claimed that all of the IP addresses in the attack were from Iran. 
And this sparked a whole debate at the time on cyber warfare, and APTs, and cyber this, cyber that. And he concluded saying the following, that all of the above leads us to one conclusion only, that this was a state-driven attack. And the citations for this, these quotes are, can all be found in this U URL. Um, but but uh, I still believe it wasn't anything that sophisticated. Um, you will see in Moxie Marlon Spike's video that I've required you to watch that it turns out it was likely just an attacker all by himself that was probably a script kitty um, that uh, just talked a really big game and wasn't very covert at all. And that is a very large juxtaposition to you know, a state-funded Iranian cyber warfare attack. The uh, impact of Komodo getting compromised by perhaps a skip kitty is severe because Komodo secures provide certs for 25 to 20 percent of all sites on the internet at the time. Now either way, they were hacked. Then there should have been compromises, right? Even even the the rumor that an amateur breaking 25 percent of the internet that is preposterous. Everything that we've done so far today should have made that impossible. That should not even be within the realm of possibility. And then they go ahead and Komodo gets hacked three times later by different attackers that year. And no one cared. And nothing happened to Komodo. Komodo, in fact, was honored at RSA 2011 and the Komodo CEO was named Entrepreneur of the Year. And that is the moral of my story of how there are zero consequences when everything goes wrong in this business. It, it is just astonishing. Now, here's a story that does scream out as a warning if you're trying to get into the CA business and uh, uh, provide a <coughs> uh, service to people. Um, DigiNoter in 2011 uh, was found to issue a rogue uh, wildcard certificate for Google.com's domain. Uh, and this was presented to actually users just in Iran. Uh, and this was noticed by DigiNoter and then quickly revoked. And DigiNoter runs in the Netherlands and they complained they claimed that they had been hacked and hackers had broken in, stole their certs, and were issuing you know, these wildcard certs and specifically targeting people, the citizens in Iran, which is a juxtaposition of you know, the Iranian state ABT hacking Komodo. So in this story, um, the result of DigiNoter getting hacked was that they eventually went bankrupt because the entire Dutch government's public-facing uh, set of websites, all the websites of the Dutch government, ran off DigiNoter certificates. If the attackers were able to get at this level, they were able to man in the middle and hack the users of the entire Dutch government. Um, the hacker, as they usually do, posted proof on Pastebin. And DigiNoter, as a result, got dropped off of many browsers' uh, trusted cert list, um, the one that's provided by default. And the link is here. And really, the, the only story, the moral here is that there are zero consequences until you are uh, so big that when you fail, you cause an entire government to fail. That's the moral of the story. That's the only consequence for uh, getting hacked if you're a really successful certificate authority. Otherwise, you know, you'll make tons of money, get uh, honored at conferences, and be named Entrepreneur of the Year, uh, regardless of how many times you get hacked. So, later in the month, 
the Dutch government seized the company, took over. That same month, the company was declared bankrupt. Uh, there are other in, items from 2011. There's Startcom. It was an Israeli uh, civic authority. And uh, there were just rumors of a breach, but that somewhat impacted their business, but they're still around. Um, and Global Sign in the same year seemed to get uh, compromised by the same hacker that uh, got DigiNoter. Uh, and uh, there were reports of it, and there was a pay spin on uh, the internet uh, boasting that, hey, I'm the guy who did DigiNoter. I just popped a global spine too and got all their code certs. <clears throat> and uh, eventually, Global Sign published a report and concluded that there was no evidence of any breach. Um, so you have to realize that with trust, simply just instilling rumors of compromise um, can degrade a system. However, that would be useful if your browser could process these rumors because it just trusts these things by default. Unless you're one of uh, the paranoid people on the internet like me, um, you might actually care about the certs that are stored in your browser. However, 99% of the users don't. So, in a normal trust system, one that would make sense, Rumors of something getting compromised would affect the flow of the system, would affect how things would work. I mean, this is how bank runs happen. If you start rumors that a bank X is, is probably insolvent, people are going to start withdrawing all their money. However, you start rumors that this, this cert got hacked, uh, the CA got hacked, you should, there's, no, like, there's no feedback in the system. There's no fluctuations throughout the system. It's, it's just like a pin drop. Um, so, another story is that VeriSign from 2010 through 2011 was repeatedly hacked and they just decided to reveal the hacks and their quarterly SEC filing in you know, October and later in 2011. And this was only disclosed because new SEC guidelines required reporting security breaches to investors. Up until then, this was not a requirement. Mind-blowing. And these guidelines have resorted, in 2011, in an explosion of filings uh, disclosing security breaches and breach risks. And um, sometimes they may be confidential disclosures to the investors. Um, but at this time, VeriSign, over this course of two years, had figures, had, had search securing over 50% of the internet ranging from .com to .net to .gov and beyond. And with the certs that were obtained by the hackers, it allowed them to effectively impersonate any company on the entire internet. Period. And to this day, they're not sure as to the extent of the hack, if it went back further or still going on or what, but they've clearly revoked these the the certs that they had and established a new key and so that cuts off the, the the ability of the attackers to keep doing damage as long as the browsers of the users are checking the blacklist properly <clears throat> so the report also implied that it was a result of a nation state attack which makes I guess investors feel a little better that they weren't knocked over by you know, a script kitty but who knows? So, now that we feel all happy and good about SSL and certificate authorities and public key infrastructure, and it's perfectly working, we know that you know it provides perfect secrecy, it provides perfect integrity, and it provides perfect authenticity. And that should just conclude this lecture, right? The moral of the entire lecture is a quote that I cite from the SSL Observatory, that the security of HTTPS is only as strong as the practices of the least competent or least trustworthy certificate authority on the internet. 
this is a map provided by the EFF SSL, um, and I had this in, I guess, the original lecture, and their map illustrates the companies that they can, the countries that they confirm are doing SSL attacks, are intercepting secure communications to decrypt them and stuff. Um, and yeah. So the flaw is that there's no feedback in the system. We are locked into these trust relationships. Market forces are driving users of, of are, are driving web up website owners to the cheapest trust vendors. And thus, it is only natural to see so many hacks. But it even goes all the way up to the most expensive CAs. So then you have to really question, does it really matter if I go for the really cheap ones? I mean, everyone's getting hacked. Or everyone has a history of serious compromise. Imagine the ones that just don't care, that are free, that don't do any form of security and don't look to check whether or not they're getting hacked. And so they don't detect it. They don't report it. Just imagine that swath of the internet that you might automatically trust. And I'm still talking about breaking the 1 out of 10 users that actually care about this stuff, as opposed to the 9 out of 10 that automatically click through. So browser vendors, after Komodo got hacked, could have dropped Komodo, but they were too big to cut out the internet. That would have broken 25% or more out of the internet. And at the end of the day, at the res from the result of that, convenience won out over security. And we still trust, by default, in our browsers, Komodo, to this day. There is no agility in the current model of the Internet. We cannot, disturb, we cannot adapt to disturbances in the forest and trust. And once we trust someone, that trust becomes forever, most of the time. I don't know how best to defend against this broken system. There is a interesting article out of NIST uh, detailing how to posture your organization uh, against the, the attack surface that you incur by having to work on the internet. That is the CA problem and the CA system. And the takeaway is that it's really complicated to, to defend yourself against this broken system. Um, I do like Moxie Marlin and Spike's work in this area. Um, Convergence is definitely a project worth checking out. If it's a Firefox plugin. Um, it is absolutely worth uh, watching the DEF CON Black Hat video on it. And it focuses instead on certificate authorities and trusted third parties and this centralized approach uh, on more of a decentralized approach um, through trust agility so that once we trust people we don't trust them forever we're not locked into this system that is just destined to decay it's actually really simple to use and it does work and it is a viable alternative to the current system um, I don't know how far they are in their efforts to uh, adapt it to Chrome and Internet Explorer, but it is working right now as a Firefox plugin. So let's talk about attacking SSL without targeting the specific authority system. We're not interested in these easy attacks. Let's talk about the hard stuff. So to recap, these messages happen. The client checks the, the server's certificate. Um, The symmetric key is established over public key crypto. And finally, the session key is used to do the rest of the communication. So there are some tools out there and there are some crypto attacks. SSL strip was put out by Moxie Marlin Spike. Um, there are other SSL attack tools, but these are the ones that I prefer. Um, SSL strip uses basic art poisoning to man in the middle an unwitting attacker, such as one in a public Wi-Fi hotspot. And you basically downgrade all the traffic to HTTP if the website allows it. Um, there is a defense against that, and we're going to talk about it. Um, then there's SSL sniff, 
And this would be used by all those attackers that once they've hacked a CA and obtained a certificate um, or certs for target websites, they can eavesdrop on all SSL and TLS traffic going to that website. <clears throat> and it's just effectively a tool that performs decrypt for you if you give it the key. Then there are beasts in crime, and then there's lastly the slew of SSL bugs that have, recent, that have come out um, both recently and over time, like Linux's GNU utils bug, uh, which is very serious, and then the iOS go to fail bug. Um, so to do an SSL strip attack, you first have to ARP spoof the victim, so you have to be on the same network. You will then impersonate the gateway and convince the user to send all the traffic through you. That allows you to intercept the traffic. So effectively what you do is very simple. You replace all HTTPS with HTTP requests just to downgrade it. And if the website allows it and the user's dumb, the attack will work. There's a tutorial on it. It's very simple. It's a two minute video. I suggest you watch it. In order to defeat this attack, your website should run strict transport security. This means SSL on all pages. The majority of the internet does not do this, and this is sheerly because of incompetence. I say again, it is because of incompetence. Um, if your engineers at your company tell you that we can't do SSL on all pages because it will slow down our website for our users and any lag for our users will simply just drive them away because the winning websites on the internet are usually the fastest. There's a click away time that is well studied that users, if they don't see the, if they don't see the results on the web page in a certain amount of time, they're just going to move on to a different activity or a different website. That is true. However, Google decided to stomp this myth. They adopted SSL on all of their web pages about two, three years ago and it accounted for less than a 0.2% impact performance. That is completely negligible and not an appreciable impact. So there is no excuse for it. If you have engineered your web architecture in such a way that it is actually a performance impact to adopt SSL on all pages, you've done it wrong. So a strict transport security prevents downgrading HTTPS to HTTP and any plain HTTP requests are just not permitted. So any HTTP request to your server will always respond with an HTTPS response or a not permitted response. SSL sniff, as I said, is if you plug in a assert, a private key, public key, uh, X509 cert to it, it will decrypt all the traffic for you if you command them, it will intercept it. It cannot be defended against. This is the tool that the bad guys are going to use against you if they hack, if they pop a certificate authority, one of the hundreds of ones, and manage to find a cert for a website they're interested in stealing your information and traffic going to. Now, obviously, if you pop one cert, you're probably not going to get the whole internet. Um, but some cert certificate authorities are large enough. Um, VeriSign comes to mind. Komodo, as I said, uh, was responsible for securing 25% of the internet. Beast falls more along the lines of a crypto attack. And I won't be covering the, the technical details of it, but you need to know that it can be done in under 10 minutes. Um, there's a useful illustration of Beast located here. Crime is similar to Beast. I snuck into Black Hat uh, last year. Um, I had a top hat and I cut holes in the top hat and wore livery spikes with my hair and no one questioned that I belonged there. Very effective. Um, I'm pretty sure I could social engineer my way into most situations, especially the hacker community. But I didn't have to pay the $5,000 fee to view this uh, presentation. It was very, very interesting. The details have been fully disclosed in their uh, last year's Black Hat. Um, they have a, the, the attack vector is limited, requires a bit of interaction with your user, but it does affect all versions of TLS and SSL all the time. They did work with browsers to ethically disclose it first, and that is very much encouraged and actually 
damn respectable. Um, so they published the details of their their exploits um, against SSL after they worked with the vendors to get them fixed. So that is the end of today's lecture. I seriously suggest, actually no, I require that you watch uh, SSL and the Future of Authenticity. It's a black hat talk by Epoxy Monospike. Um, next, you might be very interested in reading a paper uh, about detecting and defeating government interception attacks against SSL. And lastly, you want to read Chapter 10 in the Web Application Hacker's uh, Handbook. And that is it.